Hello and uh, welcome everybody to the Lightning Talks. Uh, and really important announcement before, uh, there is gonna be, after the Lightning Talks, there's gonna be a party outside and there are gonna be free drinks. So don't run away, just go to the party. We will start with uh, Julia, who is presenting Prototype Fund support for your FOSS project. Give her a big applause. Hi. When I had an idea for a project three years ago, I needed a couple of things to bring it to life. And I'm sure you're facing similar issues regardless of what kind of project you're working on. And the beginning is a bit depressing, but bear with me. So you start clueless and you have a lot of questions. So what you need is good advice of people who have experience in the field, who've run similar projects, who can give you advice on what to do and what not to do, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to run into the same hurdles as others did before. You want to learn from people's mistakes. So you end up writing endless amounts of emails, have phone calls with people who point you into the right direction or maybe sometimes not, uh, who share their contacts with you or maybe sometimes not. Um, so if you had mentors at hand before starting, things would be a lot better and easier. So you go out on your own and you have a lot of trial and error. You build something, you build a prototype, then you have the prototype, you need feedback, you need supporters, you need allies, you need people to tell you whether your idea is any good, you need a network to get the word out. To find the right people and communities can take a lot of time. You spend hours researching online international projects that are doing similar stuff. You are reading through forums um, and you're trying to get hold of networks. Um, not everyone is already in a network like the people here in the room. So being part of a network is clearly a big advantage. Last but not least, you need funding. You're dedicated to spend spare time on your project, but to get it off the ground, you need time to really focus on the project. So basic funding is essential. Funding is often the hardest part. You have the concept paper ready. You sometimes even have a running prototype. You've managed to get a lot of advice, but in order to take the final leap, you have to secure a little bit of money. Getting money for your project often involves lots of bureaucracy, paperwork, time. Especially if you're trying to stay independent, if you're trying to get funding from public institutions rather than companies. Wouldn't it be great to pitch your idea and to get a grant to build the first prototype or to build a new module for your project? All the things I just described are part of the pre-project phase. So you spend endless hours writing emails and preparing everything before you actually work on your idea. So all these like things that I just described like happen before you start to work on a project, before you write the first line of code. Sometimes things are moving really slowly. It um, takes you a lot of attempts to get a working prototype or um, to receive funding. All of these things can kill your motivation, especially if you work on the project on the side. Over the years, I've met many people who are struggling with similar problems. So we decided to do something about it. We started the Prototype Fund, a program for open source prototypes for individuals with ideas or assumptions they want to test or projects they want to develop further. Over the next three years, we're going to give out 1.2 million euros to open source prototypes. Each product, project can apply for up to 30,000 euros in funding over six months. The money comes from the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. We streamlined their application processes so that people don't have to write 20, 30, 40 page proposals. All you have to do is you have to answer seven questions about your projects. You get six months to work on your project, and during this phase, we offer you mentoring and get you in touch with people who are working on similar projects. And we also coach you on user-centered design. The network and the exchange of know-how is equally important to us as the financial support. 
So what are our focus areas? The focus areas of the prototype fund are civic tech, building digital tools for citizens, for social engagement, increasing transparency, citizen participation. Data security is another focus area code that focuses on privacy, security, or uh, the transmission of data or the minimization of data. Another field is data literacy, projects that help you to better analyze and use data. And last but not least, uh, infrastructure projects, the base layer for all the other projects. Um, what are the terms and conditions to apply? You have to be a German resident and you have to be self-employed. And of course, you have to publish your uh, code under an open source license and make it publicly available. The deadline for the first round is 30th of September, so you have 21 more days, um, but no rush. There's uh, three more rounds. The next round is starting in February 2017. Um, you can apply on the prototypefund.de website. There you find FAQs, and you can find us on Twitter um, under Prototype Fund. Um, the Prototype Fund itself is a prototype as well, so please give us feedback, ask us uh, questions that are not on the website so that we can put them up there. And yeah, I'm looking forward to many applications. I'm Julia Kloib, I'm working for the Open Knowledge Foundation. Our office is just around the corner. We're an NGO working on open data, civic tech, transparency projects. Um, so check it out and I hope many of you apply. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, next one is Luke about, uh, sorry that I say it in English, but I can't pronounce the French title, the Free Software House and the Code Tribute. Give him a big applause. Hey. All right. Okay. View. Thank you. I'm a little stressed. I'm in front of a lot of people. All right. So uh, my name is Luc Trudeau. I'm a mentor at, and I'm going to say it once, La Maison de Le Ciel Libre, which in English roughly translates to the free software house. Uh, I'm not going to use that because that sounds a little weird. I'm just going to call it ML2. So I'm a PhD student at École de Technologie Supérieure, which is a university in the Montreal area, and I do video processing, and I also do a bit of lecturing in software engineering and information technology. So uh, ML2 is an initiative in the Montreal area to get students involved and interested into the free software community. So it's been pointed out that um, in a lot of academic settings, free software isn't as predominant as it should be, and we're hoping that we can develop that. And that this model can spread also to other universities, so that's why I'm presenting uh, here. So basically, yeah, we want to get people going. Um, this is really new. We started in January, and um, we've, we're trying it out. We're trying different recipes. So I've found, or I've decided on four objectives, which you might have seen somewhere else. So basically, we want students to run free software. We want students to read and, read and learn from free software. And we want students to modify free software. And if those modifications can be redistributed, then that would be great. So what have we done so far for running free software on student computers? Well, we've started workshops. Uh, we've asked students what free software they're interested in learning. And every time we talk to somebody, Git always came up. So we started with Introduction to Git, which is really your basic Git class or Git course that was offered over lunch hours. And then we moved on to um, more advanced, if you want, contributing to Git, which goes through the Git flow and also talks about pull requests and stuff like that. We've also made YouTube videos, which are in French, for uh, Git tips and also command line, which was another thing that sadly some students don't know. And when you get to Linux, knowing the command, the command line is rather interesting or rather important. To learn from free software, we've invited open source developers in the Montreal area. So I open this invitation to you also. If ever you're in the Montreal area for a convention or whatever, and you want to come and give a talk, we'll set up everything for you so you can present to students we had Anthony Vallée-Dubois, which is a Chromium developer who came by and gave a talk on what's it like working in open source software for uh, companies like Google. So that's getting student interested in understanding that you can have a career in free software, something you guys probably already know. 
And we had Philippe Artaud, who came and talked about security and open source software, since he works for a security firm. And so open source software is, and free software is predominant, and security is also important for them. So again, the invitation is open. If ever you're around and you want to come and give a talk to something you think would be inspiring to students and things like that, we're really interested. Uh, we've also, in terms of modifying free software, we looked into doing workshops. So we have two workshops, the C and C++ edition and the Python Django edition. So in, this, in these workshops, what we do is we get students to come by again over lunch or after class. And we, get, we help them out in installing software or downloading the source, compiling the source, making sure it works, looking at the issue tracker, finding interesting bugs, and uh, contributing them upstream and then, or committing them and then following through with the patch or the pull request route process to get that accepted. And again, if you guys want to help out, we are, we're always looking for people on the other side, of the, on the project side, if you want, that can help us, you know, pointing us towards issues and stuff like that that could be easy for students. So when some students come to us and say, I'm looking for something easy to do, then if you guys can give us pointers, we can say, okay, well, we've got this issue that could be interesting and easy for you to start. Uh, we've focused on C and C++ and Python Django because those were the um, subjects that interested students. Um, what we've done so far in that, we've managed to get contributions upstream in many projects. Uh, these two projects are interesting because uh, in terms of DALA, we had the uh, XIF people and Mozilla people over uh, to, we had Nathan and Jean-Marc from DALA who came by and we actually made us a coding session with them and with students. We got three commit upstream during that session and we also had four more commits that went upstream following that. Satropole Roulante is a um, Meals on Wheels for people with disabilities. It's a project run by Savoir Faire Linux, which is a consulting firm in the Montreal area. And basically that one's interesting because the students that came to the workshop actually managed to get internships uh, at uh, the company through the work they did there. So we also see a potential for getting people, placing people in free software projects or open source projects. So we decided to push it one step further and we're doing the Code Tributon, which is a contribution marathon. Uh, basically, we want to get 100 student contributions to free software over the next semester. So that's pretty ambitious. Uh, but to do that, we've teamed up with some partners. So we've got four sponsors, which you can see here. Each sponsor is responsible for one of the different projects. We've got Chromium, we've got LibreOffice, we've got Ring, which is, uh, for some of you who might not know, it's kind of a Skype replacement that uses free software and it's really cool. You should check it out. And we have management, which or MGMT, which is a uh, management software by Red Hat. So each of the partners will sponsor us by allowing us to have access to developers from these projects who will come at the, the university and give two workshops, similar to the ones I described before, where uh, they go with students, they help them develop, they help them uh, contribute and for the student that also helps them to see who's on the other side of the commit or who's on the other side of the bug request or the pull request sorry and we're also doing seminars on subject like um, careers in open source on uh, open source business model because sometimes it's hard to see that there, you can actually make money or you can make a company that will make money and so and these seminars are open to everybody also not just students uh, the partner with our sponsors, we've been able to have free software starter kits. So that includes lots of swag, that includes um, USB bootable uh, drives with, uh, I think there's four Linux distro on that, uh, books about open source to help people understand the principles behind that. And we also have a level based reward system. So basically when you do your first contribution, you get a t-shirt that says, I contributed to free software. And then later on, we have like f level five, level 10 contribution with other interesting prizes with our partner again to help people, uh, students get involved in contributing to free software. Uh, so we're also looking for sponsors for the next iteration of this. All the information is available on our website. Uh, it's in French for now, but English is coming soon. Um, and again, if you're interested in participating in things like that, I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate, come and see me at the party later, there's gonna be free beer. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. Next one is uh, Martin about the Weir and Wayland.
So, did you notice anything? Probably not, but that's Valent. So the, <laughs> the last two presentations were already presented here on Valent. And unlike this, um, the talk last year where I only sh started a Quinn uh, and run Ocular in it, it's a full plasma session running on Valent, everything native, except Ocular, because I'm using here distro packages and I only have the Qt4 build, which then means it's going through xvalent. But even then, it works. I was able to move the window around, it just integrates as we expect. And that means with Plasma 5.8, I can say it's stable, it's usable to a certain degree. And <laughs> <laughs> there might be workflows and features which are not yet supported. Like if you need to do screenshots, you better stay on X11. If you never screenshot, Wayland is awesome. So with that, I can now say with Plasma 5.8, we are entering the public beta. It's in a state where we can say, yes, please try it. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about what we did over the last year. And one of the largest and most important areas I worked on was the input stack, which was completely rewritten. Um, the code we had before was not capable of doing it. Um, the advantages are now that we have much better touchscreen support, which is usable for such nice convertible notebooks as I have here. Uh, so we have now the first effects which actually make use of touch events. We make sure that um, on window decorations touch screens work and stuff like that. Um, the complete code in the input stack which got rewritten is unit tested. We are ensuring the security of the complete input stack through unit test. That means during tests, we start Quinn and then lock the screen and ensure that input events don't go to other windows, which you might open or do whatever. So it's really testing everything from inside. Um, all the window management functionality we have on X11, like um, the Alt F3 menu, double clicking on window decoration, that all works the same way on X11. We have new wonderful features coming to Wayland, um, like for example, modifier only shortcuts to open the Plasma menu. And thanks to the work we did on Wayland, we were able to backport that to X11. So in Plasma 5.8, that's also supported on X11 now, thanks to Wayland. We have virtual keyboard integration. Um, with Qt 5.7, thanks to the relicense. Um, the support for our lib input devices improved a lot, but that we have now touchpad gestures, which we can recognize. We don't uh, send them around yet, but we have them, and we have lots of configuration options, and also map them to the existing tools. Like if you configure your um, mouse pointer in system settings, um, it will just be loaded by Quinn the settings and applied accordingly. What's still missing on the input step is Wacom tablet support, but that's also going to be addressed very soon. In Quinn itself, the architecture changed a lot. Everything is now a platform. We have introduced a platform API similar to QPA. Uh, it's interesting that something I talked about the last time the KDE community was in Berlin at the desktop summit. I announced the plan to introduce a platform API. Back then in Qt, it was still known as Lightning. Uh, Lightning? No, not Lighthouse, exactly. And um, yeah, we have that now for Quinn. We are very e it's very easy to bring up Quinn on a new platform. And um, we are also starting to move code from Quinn Core into the platform. So everything which is absolutely X specific is now getting moved out of the normal Quinn and moved into the platform, which means also on X11, a platform is now used. Um, the most important new platform which we added is the virtual platform. And we also are able to start a Valent server on X11 in an experimental branch. So that would allow to bring Valent vendors to an X11 session. So you see the boundaries, whether in Windows is from X or from Valent, is um, going away inside the Quinn code base. We are now doing everything through the platform API. 
Um, yeah, the virtual platform is really important to us because it allows us to start Quinn during the auto test sessions. And uh, every test case starts its own Quinn. It's able to create Valent windows. It's, a it's able to create X11 windows. And we can now simulate everything. If there's a bug report, I'm able to reproduce it in the um, auto tests. We are also able to test our compositors now, which was one thing between we were never able. So we are able to render and then compare the rendering result pixel by pixel against the expected rendering result. And with that, we have built up a test suite of Quinn, which now covers about 50% of the lines. In truth, it's probably more, because buildkde.org is not yet able to test our OpenGL code. And that are a few thousand lines of code, which would go directly under test coverage if we would be able to run that. And of course, anything which is platform specific cannot be tested in the auto test sessions um, because it's, well, platform specific and we load the virtual platform, but we use other um, solutions there like mocking. Um, we improved the support for Valent applications. We have now a Kvalent integration repository in Plasma Workspace, which provides um, additional Valent integrations for a few frameworks. Also, we started to add server-side decorations for Qt applications. Um, that's done through the Plasma integration platform. For GDK applications, we started to implement the XDG shell protocol in the unstable version 5. And with that, GDK applications mostly just work if they don't crash because they are missing something. Um, I wanted to use errands for the presentations who have um, valent application, but that unfortunately didn't work. And um, very important, we have now clipboard synchronization between X11 and valent application. So that makes the workflow really nice that you don't notice whether you're on X11 or valent. Everything just integrates with each other. Um, that brings me to Xvalent. Um, Xvalent is now looking really good. Um, not everything is perfect. There are a few bugs. You saw it during the first presentation. I had to actively click into the application. Uh, that was Firefox. And uh, it depends a lot on which version you are running. I'm using here a stable system, Xvalent from packages, which is 1.18.2. If I would run 1.18.4, such problems would all be gone. 1.19, which is not yet released, is um, even better. I'm very happy with the developers. They are super responsive if you have issues. And I'm very thankful to the GNOME community, which fixed many issues in the Xvalent stack. Now, Qt on Valent, unfortunately, does not look that good yet. We had heard it also in last Knoll's talk. Um, on the desktop, it's still not there yet. You cannot really make use of it. We have still crashes if you use the wrong things. We still have freezes in some areas. We have a very interesting dialect for the subsurface protocol, which is not standard compliant and which we had to work around. We have many very important desktop features still missing. And so overall, there is still lots of work needed. Uh, you can see I reported all the bugs. I also fixed quite some bugs already. So um, yeah. but. That's unfortunately a little bit of a problem for us because we want to use Qt applications on Valent, of course, and we can only work around certain aspects from our side. And what's also interesting, we started to remove X in Quinn. So many um, code areas got moved into the platform plugin, and with that, we don't link certain libraries anymore, but we still require X Valent to start. So we still have code areas which assume that there's an X server. That's something which might also change in the future. And what's very important is that you test it. It's now in a state that you can test it, that you can run it just using, for example, Neon. Please try your applications and report issues. Please try everything you do. If something doesn't work as you're used to, 
I, as you are used to it. Please report it. We are, it's very easy for us to fix the bugs. We just need to know that they exist. And even if it's most weird thing you see, please report it because every bug helps us to find where something is wrong. So, um, and yeah, as I say, it's very easy now for us to fix these bugs and to auto test them. And on Monday, we have uh, the plasma buff, and Wayland is, of course, a very important topic for us. And we will discuss there whether we switch the neon unstable dev edition after plasma 5.8 to Wayland by default. And that's it. Thank you, Martin. Now I have it full screen here. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So. <laughs> How many of you use Windows? <laughs> Where's my target audience? <laughs> well, I didn't raise my hand either, but... Okay, so every time you're on Windows and you don't have Kate, you're a bit sad. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you knew that uh, Kate actually has a nice logo. <laughs> this bird is the Kate logo. So, yeah. So, <clears throat> Kate on Windows. Uh, Kate, was it the first version? Came sometimes 2001. And um, Kate Develop started, was it? 1998 or 1999, so, somewhere. And uh, nowadays they use the same uh, Kate part. And uh, around 2008, now I don't know this exactly, but around about 2008, uh, there was this KDE on Windows project, or for Windows. And uh, you could install a lot of uh, nice KDE applications, but if you needed just Kate, you needed to install KD libs and a bunch of stuff. And uh, you needed about 400 megabytes of installed files. And uh, you had this installer that looked a little bit like this. And there were a bunch of choices. And you see there's uh, developer mode and user mode. Um, so it was a bit scary. If, if I wanted to have my colleagues install that, they wouldn't really think about it. So, then we got Qt5, and uh, it split into smaller modules, and we got KD Frameworks 5, and it was split into smaller modules, and now everybody should be able to use KD uh, Frameworks 5, so I thought, how, how hard can it be? So uh, we had this leap of faith uh, event at work. We have 24 hours to do a project and try to finish it on time. So I said, well, I knew that it wouldn't probably work, but I wanted to make, make a shot. Uh, Emerge was the thing that they had used for uh, KDE for Windows. 
Uh, I tried it a little bit, uh, and then I knew about CMake external projects, and I thought that that's what I want to try, because I want to have full control of what I do, uh, what I need. Uh, I, I felt a little bit uh, intimidated by all the all the scripts in Emerge and all the environment variables that I didn't know why they, they were there. So I, I wanted a little bit less magic. But yeah, it failed. <laughs> but uh, I continued at uh, Academy and then I continued. And was it last year after Qt World Summit? Uh, we had this skate sprint, and at that skate sprint, we got it working the first time. Uh, Kate running on, on Windows uh, with vanilla uh, Qt, and uh, yeah. So uh, at the Kate Kate Develop World Sub uh, uh, Sprint, uh, we did this, uh, but it needed uh, Dbus and uh, didn't have all the icons. And um, then we continued, I continued at home, and then at Randa, we pushed it, really. Uh, we got the icons RCC file. Uh, we got spell checking support. Uh, it's possible to translate gates, but we would need to have the translation files, uh, the, the translations in separate packages, because now we have to take all of the packages. It's a big language package, and it's a bit hard to take out just Kate from that. So uh, that's the reason we don't have the translations today. Um, and we removed the need for uh, Dbus uh, with Qt uh, single application. Uh, so. The things that we, uh, one of the things was this uh, icon RCC. So uh, now it's in uh, uh, K icon themes. So every application that uh, uses K icon themes uh, can now use uh, an icon RCC. It, you just need to copy it to the right directory uh, with the installer. But, but with that, it should work, and you should get a theme with that. Uh, spell checking. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sonnet was a little bit modified and uh, to, to be able to use spell checking also on Windows and, and on Mac. Uh, now if you install the uh, dictionaries to, to uh, that location, it will it will find it. Uh, I'm using Hanspell because that's the one that seems to be the latest. Uh, LibreOffice uh, is using it, um, and I have a. You can see in in the NC script where I download those uh, dictionaries. Uh, translations uh, I use or. Um, was the Android project that used uh, this lib INTL light, and uh, it works. Uh, I need to really get my patch upstreamed, but I've been lazy. Uh, I had to patch it a bit so that it works more like uh, get text. So shame on me for not pushing it upwards. Uh, cute single application. That's. Uh, what we use to replace uh, the uh, K single application on on, on Windows. Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't need K, uh, Dbus or KDbus anything. So uh, yeah, and uh, that's now used on on um, on Windows and Mac. <coughs> Uh, so here are the build dependencies. We've got CMake, Visual Studio 2015. We don't support, uh, I don't want to support uh, 2013 anymore because it was breaking so easily. Uh, Qt 5.6 or greater. JOM, 
uh, that's not mandatory, but you, you can use it. Git, uh, and with the Git, you usually also get patch and Perl. Uh, Python, uh, NSYS, of course, for the installer. And then you have to install a, a, a special download DLL. And uh, for uh, frameworks 5.26, you also need Flex and Bison nowadays. So that's a new dependency. Uh, yeah. And this is basically the command that I run to compile everything. Once I have everything installed, this is the command line I, I use. So uh, the first one, this one is for the acute, uh, for the Visual Studio settings. This is, I'm setting the path to Qt, to Git, and to Perl. Actually, that line does, is not needed. Uh, and for NSYS, and then I, I just do the uh, config, uh, JSON, and then release type, install prefix, uh, and then I need to give the Perl executable, and as you see, I have it in, in the Git, and now also for Flex and Bison. Uh, and then just to say what Frameworks 5 version you want, what Kate version you want, and uh, then you just do the CMake build. And that's a screenshot from Windows. And that's actually the CMake externals files that I'm using. Uh, you can get it from my scratch repo. It should be moved somewhere. Uh, and why I used CMake externals, uh, less hidden logic, uh, only one file one CMake file, uh, and a new CMake, so that's why I used it. The only drawback is that when I have this CMake file, somebody else has another one, and then you need to update your scripts for some, you need to update some uh, dependency, then everybody has to do it themselves, so it maybe won't scale that uh, as much. What next? Uh, there are some small bugs, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Paul. And the last lightning talk before the party, don't forget about the party, uh, will be Kevin about uh, what's new in KDevelop 5. Give him a big applause. Oh, um, no. What? All right. Um, so my name is Kevin Funk. I'm working on KDE, as you would have uh, guessed. And my main focus uh, these days is on KDE Develop. Um, as you may, might have seen on the Planet KDE, we've just released um, KDE Develop 5.0. It's been a real So it took us literally uh, two years of really hard work to get that done, uh, all in our spare time. So, but that's out now. And I'm going to just show you what's new with a few screenshots. Yeah, I think about KDevelop. I think my audience uh, here knows about KDevelop, so I don't need to uh, talk about it more. But it has started in 1998, uh, <laughs> and yeah, we, are, we support uh, many languages right now, C++, Python, PHP, Ruby, nowadays QML, JS, I'll show that later. We have a pretty good debug integration, GDB, Xdebug for PHP, and now we also get LLDB support, we just had that as a, as a GSOC project. Will, th that will probably come in 5.1, not, it's not in 5.0. Yeah, and I think the, the killer feature of KDevelop is its uh, code navigation and code completion support. That's very, really strong, I think. So, what's new in 5.0? Uh, first of all, uh, a really new, fresh breeze, I guess. I think KDevelop 
with the pre style, which is default in KDE 5 or K5. Uh, I think it really looks cool, I have to say. If you remember, like in KDE 4 times, it kind of looked, I don't know, old school, but with the pre style, it's, uh, it's getting there. That's just minimal configuration, so I uh, removed a few texts from the icons and I removed some, a few widgets, but that's how it looks like. Yeah. Um, what's our biggest change in 5.0? So the biggest change is, of course, we now use Clang for C++ support. In our history, we had a custom um, parser for C++ in our code base, which was like 50,000 lines of code really hard to maintain, really hard to extend. So we ditched it and now just use uh, the library backend for Clang for parsing or for parsing code. Um, as you know, Clang really has uh, expressive diagnostics, um, uh, fixed hints, stuff like that. You all know that from the, the Clang compiler command line. Yeah, it's BSD licensed, uh, highly, highly active community, also really friendly to contributions, especially in the Clang part. Um, so we use that, and it's really turning to be a real good, ad good addition, I think. So I I'll just show a few screenshots what we have in 5.0. So that's how the new assistants look like. Um, so there's an error in source code, and as soon as you uh, hit, an, hit the Alt key, you get a pop-up pop like this. Uh, it, tell you, it will tell you right away what's wrong. You don't even need to use mouse at all nowadays. So just press Alt here, uh, you get this pop-up. It will tell you how, the code, how we could fix the code. And if you have the Alt key pressed and press 1, it will just use the first solution to it and it will edit the code and fix that one up. Nothing else needed. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, we also added some help text so people are aware of that feature because I think people just don't know you can use really cool stuff with KDevelop just by using the alt key. Try it out. Um, yeah. Code completion, that's also something which has, I think, improved a lot with uh, the, the, the Clang backend now. So we're in the string length function parameter list. We press a CTRL spacebar, and then we get like the, the best matches which we could add to the function call here. So we have a list, and the best match here would be the string um, variable right here. Uh, you, you notice it doesn't propose the, the, the int i variable because it knows it doesn't uh, has the correct type. So you get the correct uh, completion hints here. Um, yeah, that's just another screenshot. Um, we also have completion for uh, things like switch case um, code constructs. So you, you switch on an uh, enum, this, this one has a specific type, and the completion will show you just the uh, possible combinations which uh, fit into this uh, type. Right, it just shows AA, AA and BB, and that's just what is in here. It doesn't show the other one. So I think that's also pretty helpful. Um, what's also new in uh, Clang or with KDevelop 5.0 is that we can now navigate uh, macros. So if you define a macro, you can actually hover it and press show uses and it will show you each of the uses of that macro in your source file. That's pretty helpful as well. We had to remove the, um, the, uh, the pop-up where it showed the pre-processed contents of the macro that's not something we have available in Clang. So, yeah, minor feature loss, I think that one is also quite cool. Maybe we'll get it back later. Um, also, pretty interesting, um, the uh, KDevelop 4 only supported parsing C++. Um, actually, any C code you had in your project was parsed as C++, but now with Clang, we can uh, disambiguate it here, and we can parse just C or just C++. That's what it shows here. We have a CPP file. We use this code. This won't work because class is a keyword in C++. But if we use it in the test.c file, which has C extension, this one works fine. It doesn't complain. It just complains the variable is unused right now. That's it. Pretty cool, right? Um, yeah, that's just a, a bit of experiment 
we have been doing, so we also get a little bit of Objective-C support because Clang supported it. It's uh, a compiler from it for C, C++, and Objective-C, so we can use that, uh, that one as well. But that's been just an experiment. We like implemented this uh, in two hours or something. So, yeah. Something for the future. Um, help us. Yeah, we just had that on the initial screenshots. Um, there are tons of useful things uh, Clang shows in the pop-ups. Um, for example, very useful is the uh, parsing of the Doxicon style comments, uh, which you can see here. We have a function set deprecated has a parameter deprecated, but the uh, Doxicon style co um, comments doesn't fit. It has param final, but there's no final, so Clang will complain. And you can actually just fix it. It will replace this line above in comments with the right variable. That's pretty helpful. We already fixed tons of documentation issues in KDevelop uh, due to that. Uh, QML JS support. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you can do it. Clang tidy, maybe. Yeah. Should be doable. Uh, also, really new and really useful, I think. I use it daily. Uh, new language support. QMLJS. We reuse the QMLJS helper lib from Qt Creator. Thanks for that. And then we just get um, all the support we need for QML. So we have code navigation, right? All the nifty stuff we have here. And we have code completion in QML. Pretty useful as well. Yeah. Uh, just have to brace. Uh, Dennis for that, our GSAC student. He did an amazing job here. Um, yeah, somehow he's, he's missing in action now, but <laughs> I don't know. All right, uh, another thing we have per project um, widget coloring right now. So in this uh, tab bar, you see like two different colors, and you can easily notice these two files uh, belong to a different project, like this. So it's very easy to, to figure out what files it belongs to. Yeah. And it doesn't have it. Cont yeah, contributions welcome. Yeah. So the coloring right now is only for the top bar and for the project view. Uh, yeah. If we need it in more places, that would be cool. Progress reporting of Ninja and Make, also pretty useful. Uh, creator had it for uh, QMake Make Make for a long of t long time, I think. But right now, so if Ninja is almost or is Proceeding, you get a progress bar which actually shows how far the build is. And with Plasma 5.8, you also have that in the taskbar. 5.6, oh, sorry. Yeah. You also have this, thanks to Kai for that. And yeah, you have that in the taskbar. I think it's pretty cool. Easy deployment. Yeah, we, Sven worked on that one. We have an app image now. You can just download it, ex, uh, make it executable, and run it. That's pretty useful for testing. New web page, we also do have that right now. And yeah, that's already it. Uh, our to-dos, really we want to get uh, KDevelop on Windows out. Um, we have that working for years already, but we just want to make sure we uh, release, we don't release crap, so it uh, works for people, and we get uh, good feedback for that one. So we want to release that one. Uh, yeah, KDevelop on OS X, we also want to have that, but I think Windows it, is way more important. We have seen a lot of uh, requests for that one, and we want to have it. Have it done. Yeah. Well, I think lots of KDE people here, but the rest for you, if you want to join us, just go here and get some information how to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. That were all lightning talks here for today. Uh, Yes, and Charlie Pali.